Hello and welcome to this meeting of the Aaron and her missionary. We are a group of people that we feel that God has called us as missionaries. And it's not the way that uh, you as a Christian or the world would think of a missionary that we believe that God has sent us uh, on a mission. Our mission is not to uh, the lost and dying world, but our mission is to go to the church. And you say, well, I've never heard nothing like that. Well, it's, it's like, um, uh, I, don't, I'm, I don't think it's a new thing. I just think the church is in more trouble than it's ever been before. Amen. And that God has sent us to warn Christians in the churches and to warn pastors about the day that we're living in. And I believe it's, it's that bad. I believe our, our call when uh, Paul said to fight the good fight, is to fight uh, false teaching and and to fight the uh, lack of teaching the Word of God, especially when it comes to prophecy. I was a pastor for almost 40 years and uh, off and on here and there and doing different things, but uh, uh, I never learned prophecy. I was afraid of it, and I thought a lot of people that talked a lot about prophecy was a little bit off their rockers, you know, so I understand where you're coming from, but there's so many things going on in the world now that we we dived into the signs of the times and our eyes were opened to the day that we're living in and I believe God has opened them and wants us to warn the church. You see, we're living in a day, Brother Paul, where people will say that I'm a Christian, but then you'll see something come hear something come out of their mouth that is not biblical. And what you'll find out is a lot of people that say they're Christian today or they're a child of God don't believe the Bible, much less not know what it says, but they hear it and they reject it. Now remember, remember that Satan pulled the same strategy in the Garden of Eden. He, he caused Eve not to believe the Word of God. In other words, he, he said, listen, I got a new version for you. You're taking the Word of God too literal, so I'm going to offer you a new version so you can believe whatever version you want to, you see. That's what he did. He attacked the very foundation of the Word of God, and he's still up to it today. That's why I stick with the old King James Bible, because all these new versions that come out say something different, and they're leaving out the blood, and they're leaving out sin. And now what we have, guys is a whole generation that's raised up on all these different versions of the Bible. And the truth is, you can find one to say whatever you want it to say and to omit and leave out anything you want to leave out so that you can live any way you want to and not feel conviction. See, that's what Satan's whole plan is, to do away with sin. And if you do away with sin, there's no need for a Savior. There's no need for a bloody sacrifice of the Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary. You see, that's what it's all about. And God has called, I believe it. And once I started this ministry and answered the call, I started seeing all kind of other men that God had raised up to do the very same thing. And I didn't know it just here recently. And what God has called us to do, sir, ma'am, is to convince the church to turn back to true Christianity, mm -hmm. to Bible-believing Christianity, yeah. and preach the whole Bible, not just a part of it, but preach all of the Word of God. And quit scratching uh, itchy ears. Quit trying to tickle people's ears and win some kind of popularity contest, but stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, because now we see a whole generation, a whole generation. I'm 62 years old. I've got kids and, and, and one of them has kids and I'm seeing them come up and they're not hearing the same things that we heard and they're believing a whole different doctrine now. And the first 11 chapters, now what you'll notice is the first 11 chapters of Genesis are under attack. If you could take away the first 11 chapters of Genesis, go home and read them. And then watch the news and you'll see what's going on in the world. The devil's trying to erase. You're talking about count, uh, cancel culture. He's trying to cancel Bible-believing uh, uh, 
culture is what he's trying to do, you see, and he's being very successful with it. So God has called us, and i got to be careful what I say on uh, Facebook and YouTube and stuff, uh, but I say what, what I want to say, I just say it in a way that I want to say it, amen, that's all I'm going to say about that, but uh, we are fighting the forces of evil, and we want to turn the church back to the Bible. That's what we're trying to do. And if we can turn the church back to the Bible, and I'm not saying about every pastor and every church, but I'm listen, I've been in a lot of churches as an evangelist and a pastor of a growing church. I got invited out a lot. And it is amazing to me what some people have to listen to on Sunday mornings. Amen. And why do you get up and put your clothes in, clothes on and, and, and go to all the trouble to go to church to hear some of that nonsense that's coming out of the pulpits across America is beyond me. You need to get out of that dead old uh, dried up church where that, where that man is not no more called than the man on the moon and get you under some anointed, God-filled, Holy Ghost-filled preaching because that's what you need more than you need anything else. Amen? Amen. Amen. Listen, if, if America is going to come back to God, it's going to be through the church. It's going to be through a Bible, the Bible-believing church. The politicians can't do it. No. <laughs> They're not called to do it. Amen? Amen? So we want to warn the church that Jesus is coming. As a matter of fact, we believe that we are in the season of his return even now. And the reason we believe that is not because of a feeling or an emotion, but because of the signs of the times that Jesus talked about. And Jesus, I heard this morning I was watching a very well-known pastor, and if I said his name, every one of you would know him. And he made three or four bad mistakes when he talked about this. He said, no, you can't know the hour of the day. And then he came back and said, you can't know the season or the times. That's wrong. Jesus said, you'll know the season." You'll know the time. He said, here's the signs of the times, and then he gives them. He gives them. And we, we studied one last week, natural disasters. We studied Israel becoming a nation. He said, when you see these things, then you'll know that my time is near and even at the door. So we've been pointing all these things out that the Lord talked about the signs of the times. And we're trying to, uh, we started off trying to see if we were in the season of the end times, you see. And we found out that we are, so now we're just going over it and learning about it and finding out more and more and more that points to us that we are definitely living in the shadow of the tribulation period like no other generation has before us. So we've been going uh, through the book of Revelation, a short survey or study through the book of Revelation, and we're going through it topographically, not chronologically, uh, trying to stay uh, uh, relevant with, with, with things that people want to know about. And we're trying to see, are we lining up with the Great Tribulation? Because that, that generation that will witness or be uh, raptured into heaven will be right before the Tribulation period. So, we looked at chapter 13, you'll remember chapter 13 and verse 1. And we looked at that because of the personalities that are introduced during the tribulation time. And we've seen in verse 1 that the beast, the beast which is the Antichrist, stepped out on the world stage. And we're going to see tonight that he becomes a world ruler. As a matter of fact, he becomes the world ruler ruler okay and he will be anti-christ as a matter of fact he will be the anti-christ anti-god anti-bible you see that's how you undercut under that's how you cut away god's authority by cutting away his word all right now he will come to power first of all first of all in europe we learned this from Daniel, and one of the best ways to interpret the Bible, or the best way to interpret the Bible is with the Bible. That's why uh, the Bible says to divide the word rightly. Take what the whole Bible says, and the best book to divide the revelation to figure out what it's talking about is the book of Daniel. You see, study the book of Daniel. We went through that in our Sunday school class there for many, many months, and we learned a lot about it. And Daniel uh, interpreted King Nebuchadnezzar's dream with Daniel's own dream. And he's seen the Roman Empire being 
revived, okay, when you get down to the bottom of the statue. And the Roman Empire will be revived during the time of the Antichrist. That's one way that we know we're in the season. And the Roman Empire is, it, it was over, covered a territory of 10 modern day nations. And we've seen these 10 nations that lie on the ground or the territory uh, of the Roman Empire have now become nations in our lifetime our generation, and even more nations have come together as a, a conglomeration or an alliance together called the European Union, okay? So we have seen the Roman Empire revive. And then in verse 2, he says that this, this Antichrist, this beast, uh, will have great power and authority, and he will receive it from the dragon. And we know that the dragon is revealed to us over in uh, revealed to us in the Revelation as Satan himself. So Satan, behind the scenes, the Antichrist is, the beast is not Satan, okay? He receives his power from Satan and his authority from Satan. Now keep in mind, and we learned this last time we looked at uh, the Revelation chapter 13, that after the church is raptured, he that restrains evil will not restrain evil anymore. Can you imagine a world where God is not holding back evil? No. We're living in a, a very, very evil day now. Amen. I mean, we're sitting here tonight knowing that somebody's going to get murdered in Louisville probably tonight. Maybe more than one, mm -hmm. right? Just right here in Louisville. Right. A very, ain't no telling what's going on behind closed doors in homes around uh, the city of Louisville and so on and so on all across America and the world. But when... When the church is gone, the restrainer that holds back evil will be uh, taken away. He won't hold evil back anymore, and Satan will be loosed off his leash, and he will end up controlling the entire world. That's what we're going to see tonight. Look at it in verse 3. He said, And I saw one of his heads, okay? One of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Now, when I read that, I thought, man, I got to get this right. I've, I've talked about this. I've thought about this verse many times as, as a preacher. And the way it is always taught that I've heard and the commentators that I read after and trust, they all said they believe this was a man. One of, the, one of his heads was a man. And that he had a wound that looked like he was dead. He could have been dead. And by trickery, he was made to see that he was brought back to life. And the reason I say trickery is because, first of all, Satan has not been given the power to give life. Amen. Satan cannot resurrect a dead. He cannot bring somebody to life that's not been born. He has not been given that power. Okay? So if he does raise, if this means he's raised a man, then, then it's a trick. The man didn't die. But I don't believe it's a man. And I'll show you why I believe that. Remember, the Bible is of no private interpretation, okay? What that means is nobody can stand here and say, God's told me specifically what this means. I'm going to show you from the Word of God what I believe this means. It says, now, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, okay? Remember that all the world wondered after the beast. All the world's going to see this happen. I believe, I believe, Now I'll leave room to be wrong, but I'm going to show you why I believe it, okay? I believe he's talking about a nation. I believe he's talking about a nation because, look, he says one of his heads. No human being has more than one head. So he can't be talking about a human being. One of his heads was wounded, okay? Now, it could mean that one of the Antichrist fellow leaders was wounded to death, and he raised him. Now, I leave room for that, but let me show you why I believe it's a nation. Now, I can go either way on this, but I'll show you why I believe this. Now, here, you remember this? Can you all see it over there? Okay, this is a symbolic of the beast and the characteristics of him. Remember, we talked about this, the lion's head and the leopard and the bear and all that, but what I want to draw your attention to, notice that there's 10 men or 10 
dictators or kings because you have ten crowns. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay? But you only have seven heads. Okay? The reason you only have seven is because one has four. One, one has taken over three others. One dictator of a country has taken over three others. So he brings to the party four European countries. Yeah. You see that? Mm -hmm. And he brings with him the authority that goes with it. You say, well, where do you get that at? I believe he's talking about ten nations. Ten nations here is represented in these heads, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the uh, dictators are represented here in these horns with the crowns that are on each horn. How do you get that? From the word of God. You make up your own mind. It don't make a whole lot of difference except for when we see it, we'll know, hey, that's what it was talking about, right? But I don't think it was a man. I think it's a nation that he repairs that looks like it's dead, that he brings back to life. Look at it in Daniel. Daniel chapter seven and verse eight. He said, I considered the horns. Here we are getting ready to divide the word. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 8. I considered the horns. We're getting ready to consider the horns. What are they? Who are they? And behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. One horn, which has to be a leader, mm -hmm. a king, a warrior. He takes over three others, so he brings four nations, four European nations. That's who he's talking about when he considered the horns, the ten horns. The ten European nations that constitute the territory of the revived Roman Empire. He said he, he brings four to the ball game, to the table, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Who talks? People. People talk. A man talks. He's got eyes and he's got a mouth and he speaks great things. So in this, I believe that the horns are people. Whether it be a man or a woman, they're the, they're the kings or they are the dictators of these nations, you see. So then you look at verse 11 in that same chapter of Daniel. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. It's a man. There's a man like Hitler. You remember Hitler? The great words he spoke to get a whole nation to follow him to their doom. And I beheld even till the beast. Now look. He's identifying the horn as the beast. Could be a beast because of the beast. The beast was slain. He goes over to the end of the tribulation where the beast is done away with, you see, and cast into the lake of fire for a thousand years. So to me... With Now, I'm not just picking the book of Daniel at random because you interpret almost the entire book of tribulation or of Revelation with the book of Daniel. He says, and I, and I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning fire. So, but like I said, I leave room to be wrong, but I think that is the best interpretation of what is going on here with this, with this one world ruler. Uh, that you see there. Now, this Antichrist, whether it's a man that he heals, uh, again, it would be a trick. Of course, he, he's, a, he's a trickster. You know, he, he don't mind lying. He'll look right, right in the camera and say, I ain't attacking the Ukraine, right? Amen. I've got all these 100,000 men over here and all these tanks, but I ain't going to do nothing with it, right? We all believe that. Well, Satan, don't have, Satan does not mind lying a bit. Amen. So anyway... He is going to use this event in Revelation 13, 3, the healing of one of his heads as a way of uh, winning control of the world. Because remember, now let me remind you of something. Remember, he comes as a man of peace. He don't come as, as a Putin or one of these war type dictators. He comes, he's going to win the world with peace. And we've seen that 
him winning the entire world in Revelation 6 with the four horsemen. Mm -hmm. The four horsemen, remember that? The first horseman was the white horse rider. Mm -hmm. The white horse rider came out of heaven. Of course, it's the Antichrist. And he comes out, the Bible says, to conquer. He comes out conquering and to conquer. He has a bow, but he don't have any arrows. But he has a crown. You see, he wins. He wins by his words. He wins by peace. And he wins with power and with authority as well. Okay? Now, he's healing. He heals this nation or he heals this person, whichever it is. Could you imagine if, like, like if uh, Russia is bombing out Ukraine, then it is clear that Putin's strategy is to destroy all the infrastructure. He just wants the land, right? And he, he talked about, I heard him say it, we need to cleanse the Ukraine. We need to get all them Western world people out of there, or people that's not full stock Russians out of there, and repopulate the Ukraine, the breadbasket of Europe, with full-blooded Russians, you see? But could you imagine, after it all been shelled out and everything, if all of a sudden the Antichrist could restore it all? And he had all this power at his fingertips to bring all these nations together. It's a possibility that I want you to consider. But however he does it, the Bible says in the bottom part of verse 3, and all the world wandered after the beast, okay? He comes disguised as a great humanitarian. He's going to be a man of peace, a man of prosperity, a man, a man of plenty. Or he's going to promise the world plenty, and he's going to have a visible power to do it, okay? But all along, he's going to be pulling people away from God. And leading people down a path that's anti-God and anti-Christ. And this lie will be consummated with the world's allegiance to the beast, the Antichrist, the white horse rider. And then once he gets on the throne and he's controlling the whole world, then we'll see the real him, right? Mm -hmm. He's going to turn into the dictators that we've seen before, but way, way, way more powerful. Because the next horse rider, you'll remember, was the red horse rider. The next one comes out, and what's he do? It says he takes away the peace from the world. Three and a half years into the tribulation time, he's done signed the peace treaty with Israel. Three and a half years in, he breaks it. Okay? That's when everybody's going to have to pick a side. The mark of the beast is in place. If you don't take the mark, you can't buy or sell. And he's going to take away the peace of the world. And the Bible says that he'll cause people to kill one another. And he's given a great sword. He's going to have nuclear weapons. He's going to have great armies, great navies, great air forces at his disposal, you see. And he's going to come after Israel with a vengeance. He hates Israel. He hates Israel. And he's going to come after all those that that are trying to follow Christ during the tribulation period. He's going to try to kill them all. Kill them all. Followed by the black horse rider. And he has a pair of balances in his hand that says, one piece of bread for a day's wages. And we see how easy that could happen just by our inflation here over in Ukraine and, and all the bad decisions that our government has made in this previous election. That was the worst decision we made. Mm-hmm. So then, then the pale horse rider comes, and his name is Death, and hell follows after him. This is all in Revelation 6, the first eight verses. And he will kill, this is the Antichrist, he will kill one quarter of the world's population with war and hunger at that time. Okay? Now, all this starts with the Antichrist healing one of his heads, and the world surrendering who? The Bible says, and all the world wandered after the beast. Now, Remember, he does all this with the power of the dragon. Satan has given him all his power and all his authority. So here we go. Here we go into verse 4 of Revelation. And look what it says. And they worshiped the dragon. See that? They worshiped the devil. And they, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast. They worshiped the devil, Satan, and they worshiped the Antichrist, saying, who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him? In other words, if you can't beat him, join him, right? Mm -hmm. There's nobody like him. Now, under, and they worship the dragon. 
This is what Satan has always wanted. This is what he's always wanted. And what I want to do is give you a picture of Satan and the way what's in his heart so that you can see why things happen the way they're happening in our world today. Okay? What I want you to do, what I want you to start doing is when you see things that people, you hear things that people say and you see things that people do, I want you to look at it from a spiritual aspect. You see, because there's a whole universe around us that can't be seen. Remember, Elijah was shown and the curtain was pulled back and he seen flaming chariots surrounding the children of God. You see, there, there's, there's demon activity and there's angelic activity going on. Uh, each one of us has had an angel assigned to us to watch out over us. And, and again, I've had to apologize to mine many times for what I've put him through. But, but there, there are things going on that we can't see. But if we'll look at things with spiritual eye, we can know where they're coming from. You see? Our, our battle is not against flesh and blood. But it's against that evil spirit that is driving the world. Okay? Amen. So, let me introduce you to Satan and show you some of the things, show you what's in his heart and see if you can recognize this same spirit in the world today. Just real quick. He says, and remember, if you want to look this up, I got it on your sheet, sir, but Isaiah 14 and then Ezekiel 28, okay? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Now, he was the anointed cherub. He was, I mean, he was it, man. And he talks about him falling. And we know that when he fell, he took a third of the angels with him. He said, son of the morning. He was the brightest of them all. You see, he was like the sun coming up in the morning compared to the rest. How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Then he says, for thou hast said in thy heart. See that? He's a created being. He said in his heart, angels are given a free will, just like us, right? He has said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. Now notice all the I wills. That's one way you know that somebody's in the flesh or being controlled by an evil spirit is they're always saying, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You see that? Mm -hmm. I will be like the most high. Then he says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And he already said that once. Why did he say it again? I had them both on the same page, didn't I? <laughs> then Ezekiel, you go over to it. Now he says here, in his heart, instead of being thankful for what God had made him for, you see, and what had cre God had created him for, he rose up and exalts himself above God. Now stay with me. He rises up and he, he exalts himself above God. He said in his heart, I will raise up above God and I'll take his place and I'll be God. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's what he done in the Garden of Eden when he got Eve to doubt the word of God. Right? And that's what he's doing today with people all over the world. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing in our schools, in our government, in all our neighborhoods and around the land because people have that same spirit in them that says, I will raise myself above God. I know more than what the Bible says. I know more than what God says, and I'm going to do it my way. Look what he says in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28, thus saith the Lord God, thou sellest up the sum. In other words, he's it, man. He's the model of perfection. He's everything added together, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He's got horns and a pitchfork and a tail. I mean, Nancy's like a young Robbie Redford. <laughs> Smarter. She loved Robert Redford. And, and uh, full of wisdom. Smarter than Einstein and good looking. I mean, this man, he got it going on. He, he's above all his peers. Then it says in verse 13, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. 
the sardis, the topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, and the emerald, and the uh, carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy fabrics. In other words, he rolled up in the nicest ride, mm -hmm. dressed to the hilt, you see? And, and some pe and what he what you see is so some people are so materialistic. Mm -hmm. All they think about is what they can get, mm -hmm. what they can wear, what they can have, what they can obtain. You see? And then he says, a lot of people don't realize this, and, and you're really an old Bible thumper if you bring this up. The workmanship of his of thy tablets and of thy pipes were prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Listen, he was not only musical, he is music. Not all music, of course, now, because God uses music, and God's people uses music, but he invented music. Music was made into him. Music does something to people, if you have not noticed, you see? So it's not a surprise that he uses music today, right? What brought him down? Pride. Amen. Pride. Amen. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. He's, he was the leader of music. He was right there at the throne of God. He was leading the choir, man. I have said, Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created until, until iniquity was found in thee. So he said, Hey, I'm all that. I know my truth. I know what the truth is. And I'm going to do it my way. And my friends, if we do not see that spirit working today like never before, then my name's not Brian Campbell. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that way when I was a kid, what we're seeing today. It wasn't that way when I was growing up. But it's, I mean, listen, the world has become much smaller, yes. much smaller. And now we can see everything happening in real time. Mm -hmm. Let me show you something. Remember this verse, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. Now before we got saved, before the Holy Spirit come to live in us, we walk along with the world. It's on a course. Yeah. Now the Bible, now what the world tries to tell you is it started with a big bang and it's getting better and finally we're going to end up in utopia. Well, what I've noticed, it ain't getting no better. And, and the truth is it started off with utopia in the Garden of Eden. And then it's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. It's going to end with a big bang. Amen? Mm -hmm. So the world is on a definite course. And there's a leader of it. And he is, according to the prince of the power of the air, you remember Satan was talked of as he was Beelzebub, the lord of the flies. They move around, man. They fly, him and his demons. And they are moving this world in a certain direction. Right? And, and it's all about, now here's what I want you to remember. It's all about taking away the authority of the word of God. That's what he does because he denied God's word. God created him to be a certain thing for a certain thing. He said, no, I'm going to do what I want to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it my way. I'm going to do my truth. Now look what he says. That same spirit, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Remember, remember, we should not hate the people that oppose God, but that spirit that is driving them, you see? That's who God has called us to battle with, is that mm -hmm. spirit. And we battle that spirit with truth. That's why I thank God for y'all coming here. It's so much easier to do this when there's people listening in the room, right? And I thank God that you, that you see the need to stand for truth. Mm -hmm. For what we see going on in our churches today is despicable. And people that call themselves children of God and deny the word of God. You can't be a Christian and not believe the word of God. Amen. We're born out of the word of God. Amen. Born of the spirit of God. Amen. So we see a picture of the proud. Satan has raised himself above God. And that same spirit we see working in people today like never before. We are the first generation with the WWW. World Wide Web. And, and th listen, all you have to do is push a button. You can Google anything. Information, information, things going on. Now think about it. The generation before us, my grandpa lived up in the mountains. He never, listen, he never drove a car. 
All he had was a rock sled and two mules. That's two generations ago. Yes. Two generations. He never seen a TV in his life. The only information he got is when somebody finally got up the holler to tell him. Now, Grandma was set. I'll never forget. She was set in her little rocking chair looking out down the holler there. And uh, no, no houses within 10 miles of the place. And she sat there with her little corn cob pipe. I'll never, never forget her packing it and smoking it, listening to the party line. Most <laughs> people don't even know what a party line is. Right That's what everybody yes. in the neighborhood used the same phone line. Yes. And she didn't even start talking sometimes. She didn't even try to keep it a secret, you know. But they, listen, they did have, not have access to information, which meant Satan did not have access to their minds and their hearts. What they believed, what they were told at church, and what God the Holy Spirit had showed them in the Word of God, you see. So now we are reaping all these minds that have been made available to Satan through the internet, through television, and then through the internet. You used to down on the farm, you didn't hear none of this stuff, but now all human beings, almost all human beings on the planet are accessible real time, real time, right? Mm -hmm. And Satan has used this tool well to spread the lie, and here it is, here it is, you decide what is the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the lie. You decide. Now listen to people on the television. Listen to the politicians. Listen to the religious leaders. This counterculture of not believing the Bible and that man knows more than God. People claiming to be Christian and don't even believe the Bible. Don't judge them, they say. The Bible says you should judge with a righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. Judge not that you be not judged, but about two verses later it says, but judge with a righteous mm -hmm. judgment. You better judge. You better discern what spirit's talking to you. Mm -hmm. You better figure out what's real and what's wrong, what's true and what's false. Amen? Amen. We're supposed to have a discerning spirit. According, judge everything against the word of God. Yes. If it disagrees with the word of God, then it's a lie. Let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? Amen. Just like Satan, man is rising themselves, or raising themselves up above God. In their hearts they say, I decide what is right for me. Have you hear them all the time? This is my truth. Yep. Now, if that means you're telling me what's happened to you, okay, that can be your truth. But if you tell me what you think and what you believe about anything and it goes against the word of God, your truth is a lie. You made it up in your heart and in your sinful mind. And our, our minds are wicked. Our hearts are wicked beyond all measure, you see. And you made up what you want to be true. But if it goes against the word of God, my friends, and I've got to go back to the KJV because I don't trust all these other, I don't know which translation you're looking at they might have made it okay what you're thinking but you go back to the word of god that god has used and that god has started all these revivals with and all these different things for the english speaking people that's old king james bible and if what you believe goes against that then you have believed a lie and listen i'm not one of those guys that wants to jump on you because of your sin but I don't want you to tell me or to tell my kids at school or anywhere else that sin is not sin. Right. Because when you try to tell somebody that sin is not sin, then they don't see the need of a Savior. Right. Amen. Listen, I, I've sinned as much as you, probably more. But God has forgiven me of my sin because the Bible showed me I was a sinner. Paul said, I would not even know that I was a sinner unless the law didn't tell, unless the law had told me, thou shalt not covet. You see, it is the word of God. It is the law that has been our schoolmaster to teach us that we're sinners and that we are in need of a Savior. And just like Satan said in the Garden of Eden to get Eve to turn her back on God is to 
do away with the convicting power of the Word of God. That's what it's all about. That's where the war is at. And that's what God has called us to combat. So what you're doing here tonight is worthwhile, my friends. We're going to stand for the truth. We're going to sound the alarm because so many have said in their heart that have power in this country and power around the world that they disagree with God. They disagree with God's book. They disagree with the preacher of the book. And my friends, what you need to know is that everything is on the line. I'm not saying you're any worse than me. I'm saying you're worse off than me if you haven't met Jesus. Yeah. I'm not trying to beat you over the club because you sinned. Uh, whatever your sin is, that's between you and God. But don't let Satan convince you that it's not a sin because then he has blinded you to your need of a Savior. And everything is on the line. Your eternal soul hangs in the balance of what you believe about sin. Yeah, but when you raise yourself above God, you see, then you have the spirit of Satan blinding your eyes. And I know that thus saith the Lord, and a man preaching like this is old-fashioned and out of date. And people want to say it's irrelevant for this generation. But I'm here to tell you it's exactly what this generation needs. Yes. Amen. Yes. Come on, it might be old-fashioned, my friends, but I realize I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior, and I found one in the Lord Jesus Christ, and He saved me and washed me in His blood. Amen. God has said, men have raised themselves above God. I'm going to say a couple things here and quit. God has said in His Word, Thus said the Lord, God made a male and female. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. Now man says in his heart, man has said in his heart, I'll make myself whatever I want to be because I'm God. I've raised myself above God, you see? And there ain't nothing wrong with that. God has said marriage is between a man and a woman. But man has said in their heart, I will redefine marriage to what I want it to be. And there ain't nothing wrong with because we've raised we've raised ourselves above God God has said thou shall not kill but man has said I, I will I will take the unborn baby and throw them into a garbage can while they're still alive because I have raised myself above God God has said there's no sexual relations before marriage, or it's a sin. But man has said, I will not deny myself of any sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. Because they have raised ourselves above God. Amen. 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 God said, parents, bring your children up to know me and to fear me and to love me and be loved by me. But man says, no, I'm going to let the government raise my kids. I'm going to let the entertainment industry raise my kids. I'm going to let Hollywood and, and uh, Disney World and, and Nashville raise my kids, you see, because they've raised their self above God. Satan said in his heart, I'll do it my way. I will, I will, I will do it my way. Not yours, God. Forgetting he was a created being and thus saying to the yeah. creator. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Remember what Jesus said? Not my will, mm -hmm. but thy will be done. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, what you believe about truth. Jesus said, I am the way. That means there's no other way mm -hmm. or he's a liar. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. That means he is the only truth. There ain't no other way to heaven except through him. He is the truth. And he said, thy word is truth. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. There's no way, there's no truth, there's no life except by me, he said. No man comes to the Father except by me. Yes. So will you today to decide, thy will, O oh God, not my will, but thy will be done. Or will you go on with with the prince of the power of this air, 
as he's dragging this world to hell with him because he hates God and he hates you. Amen. Will you keep denying the truth because you know in your heart there's a God that created you and created all things. And God is love and grace and mercy and he proved it by giving his only son that whosoever believeth in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Come to him before it's everlasting too late. Will you do it? Pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for that heart right now that you've tugged upon and that you've persuaded by the reality of your person and power yes. that they're lost and undone in their sin. But you gave a Savior, your Son, your only begotten Son, to die in their place and to carry the load of guilt and shame for them and me that through him they might be washed and made whole. Right now, would you cause them to trust? Would you give them the faith to believe that they might trust you? Oh, God, would you have your way? Would you have your way with that soul tonight? Lord, we ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you, beloved.